Hi, and welcome to Bright Minds from Tickmill. I'm your host, Patrick Munley, and in this series, we're setting out to answer some of the most commonly asked questions around investment and trading through entertaining and insightful conversations with seasoned insiders. For our final episode in this season of Bright Minds, we thought we'd do something a little bit different. Throughout the recording of the last 11 episodes, we've heard from so many fantastic guests from a range of different fields. And looking back on all these great conversations, we noticed some clear themes that came up again and again. In this season finale special, we're going to look back and explore those themes and discuss a selection of interview highlights with a very special guest. The three recurring themes we identified are cultivating your mindset, identifying patterns, and using tech as a tool. What's fascinating about these topics is that they came up consistently across different episodes, regardless of our guest's area of specialism. With technology and pattern recognition frequently coming up in discussions where we weren't expecting to hear about them. The cross-pollination of ideas has been one of our favourite things about this first season of Bright Minds. And here today, to look back on the season and discuss these important recurring topics, is Ingmar Matus. Ingmar is the co-founder of Tickmill and the executive director of Tickmill Group Limited. Before launching Tickmill, he served as the CEO of foreign exchange broker Armada Markets and the head of brokerage of global investment firm Admiral Markets. Ingmar brings almost two decades of experience in managing financial services firms, with a focus on operations, financial technology, securities trading, and risk management. Inmar, thanks for joining us today. So let's kick things off by discussing our first major theme of the season, which is cultivating your mindset. Before we jump into a few clips, Ingmar, I'd love to hear about your experience with developing your own mindset. Uh, hello, Patrick. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for uh, inviting me uh, over. Uh, I've been enjoying your shows uh, a lot, and I think uh, you're doing a great deal in terms of educating the uh, the trader community out there. So um, my journey really has been uh, it's, has been quite long. So I started trading uh, back in uh, 1997. I've I've gone through uh, many, many, many roads uh, during my journey. So. I've traded all the asset classes. Uh, at some stage, I was focused on uh, technical analysis. Uh, at some stage, I was focused on fundamental analysis. And uh, it's, it's, it's been really, really interesting uh, road. And of course, I've seen all of the market crashes uh, and, uh, and all of the booms uh, the last 20 years or so. One of the guests who really informed us on that was, uh, was Tony Blauer, who appeared in episode two to talk about fear. So let's hear from Tony. When I go in the fear loop, what immediately starts to happen is, and, and this is universal, regardless of gender, age, experience, doubt, hesitation, procrastination. Those three steps happen automatically, and they can happen like in a nanosecond. Overcoming that fear is a really key development in the ability to consistently trade the markets. Is, is, how, how did you manage fear in terms of your own trading, Ingmar? It's a good question. And uh, I would say maybe when uh, once uh, you have a certain amount of fear uh, in you, then uh, you tend to maybe take uh, decisions that you, you otherwise uh, wouldn't. And uh, if I look back 20 years, the effect that fear had, me, uh, had in me was... Uh, was uh, oftentimes quite dependent on the actual capital that uh, I had available for myself and the actual position size that I took uh, in each and every instance. When uh, the level of fear becomes too big, then uh, you have already made a mistake. So you have probably committed too much uh, capital or your position size is pretty, pretty big uh, already. And you should probably look back. That's an excellent point and, and something certainly I've experienced over the years as well. Uh, I, I guess a key part of understanding our mindset and how to make better decisions is about recognizing our biases. In episode five, Paul Craven spoke to us about the field of behavioral finance. And within that episode, he outlined for us a couple of biases common in the financial industry. Let's hear from Paul. I think the most pernicious bias, though, is probably confirmation bias. And uh, again, just to, just to refresh people what that means, it means the idea being I've, I've come up with my conclusions. I may have made a good case to, to buy something, say, a stock. And the fact it's gone down 5 or 10%, it, it doesn't make me challenge or question myself. 
That's such a great point from Paul. Uh, for me, when starting out as a trader, the, the biggest problem I had was directional bias. Uh, I, I, I wanted to enforce my will upon the market, either going up or down on the market, which, as we all know, is a, a fatal flaw. In terms of your experiences of, of biases, Ingmar, what, what, what have they been like? I have uh, been able to understand uh, the, the, the strength of my confidence level, you know, and uh, it's been the case that uh, I might be confident today, but I don't trade. I might, might be confident again tomorrow, but I don't trade. And only 10 days later, uh, I understand that uh, my confidence level is pretty much extreme. And this is the time I need to actually place the trade. So I'm delaying and delaying, delaying the decision making un until I'm really, really confident. But even then, I, I am mindful about the position size and the risk. Yeah, and I guess the uh, confidence and um, when to actually execute a trade, position sizing and risk all funnel into one of the central challenges for any trader, and that's sticking to a trading plan. As markets shift and circumstances change, it can be tempting to abandon a carefully planned strategy to risk chasing bigger gains or trying to avoid those painful losses. Uh, Phoebe Chamer, while discussing the gender investment gap with us in episode one, spoke about research showing women outperforming men in the market over the long term simply due to a natural tendency to be more risk averse and patient. Let's hear from Phoebe. Research shows that women actually do perform better when they invest. And I think it's down to a few factors. One of them is kind of patience. I think women set their sights on the long-term goal, which is what any good investor should do anyway. And they kind of will buy a good, solid, sound investment that perhaps they've done their own fundamental research on, or they've relied on a professional to do so. And they hold that. And, and through, through thick and thin, volatile times, and that's how you can have a really good investment strategy. Yeah, I guess one of my favourite uh, comments from the, uh, the discussion we had with Phoebe was the idea, I think Christine Lagarde made the point that uh, if we'd had Lehman sisters instead of Lehman brothers, the world like, <laughs> might have looked quite a bit different uh, through 2008. What, what are your thoughts on that, Ingmar? To be honest, I, I tend to agree, and uh, and I was just thinking when we when we heard the clip that um, that how would I differentiate women uh, in in comparison to men, and uh, I would I would say that uh, women definitely have uh, better intuition, and uh, the other quality that uh, women have is uh, that uh, their ability to make decisions uh, in overall uh, they are more humble uh, in in their decision making. So a typical man would uh, would place a trade being uh, in full confidence and uh, and feeling like they would go to war and they would win the war while women probably would um, be more humble and would rather maybe ride a trend than fighting against the trend. Excellent point. And as I mentioned earlier, one of the most interesting things about having conversations with all these experts working in different fields has been noticing the points of contact between their areas of interest. Uh, here, Dr. Andrew Miniker is discussing the brain and mindset in episode four that we did on neuroeconomics, but also covers another key theme, identifying patterns. Let's hear from Andrew. The field of neuroeconomics says that the brain is a prediction machine, basically. Um, so in that moment of, I call it the heat of the moment, just, should I get into the trade? Should I stay in? Should I get out? At those moments, the brain is trying to predict what's about to happen. And as a result, there's a, a whole host of biological functions occurring in the body and in the brain. And I'll just finally say that emotion is both a body state and a brain state together at the same time. Yeah, I mean, that is a, is a fantastic comment. And I think um, going back to the idea of the evolution of trading, uh, for a long time, the idea was that uh, you were to trade without any emotion and to ignore your emotions and just execute your trade almost in a robotic fashion. But whereas more progressive research now certainly suggests that better traders are those who accept and understand their emotions as opposed to uh, avoiding them. Any thoughts on that, Ingmar? I completely agree with you. And, uh, and uh, when it comes to emotions, of course, uh, what I found really fascinating at Tickmill and, uh, and over the years when I've been managing risk myself, uh, when it comes to our exposures, then uh, whether uh, a person is in, uh, in Europe, Africa, Asia, or, uh, 
or somewhere in Latin America, they generally have very identical uh, emotions when they see uh, news coming out or when they see a spe specific uh, chart pattern. And uh, when it comes to myself, then uh, the fact that I've passed through so many crises uh, over the years, uh, whether uh, the, the 2000, uh, the 2008 and, and the Corona crisis and, and so forth, and uh, it has made me personally, when it comes to my emotions, almost uh, fully emotionless. So I, I might win, uh, have a good trade, I might uh, lose, have a really bad trade, but I, I really don't uh, see uh, any big fluctuations of emotions in, uh, in myself. Yeah, and that's a, certainly an important uh, progression in any trader's career. And that idea of recognizing subconscious pattern recognition whereby you Indeed, spend so yes. much time watching, watching the markets, watching charts or watching news flow that you subconsciously recognize patterns that, uh, that, are, that are, are developing. And so I guess that brings us on to our second big topic of identifying patterns. How could we not hear a clip from the infamous Martin Armstrong? In episode three, Martin outlined for us his economic confidence model, which tracks patterns in global capital flows over long periods in order to get a clearer picture of what the future markets might hold. Let's hear from Martin. We took a list of financial panics that spanned 224 years, and that they were international, not just domestic. And I just you know, took the 26 events and divided into that and ended up with 8.6 years. And I just thought it was an average. So I plotted it out and it picked even the 87 crash right to the day. Yeah, I mean, Martin is uh, is a rigorous student of history, to put it mildly, and um, someone I followed for for many, many years. And his modeling is is really fantastic. And um, and I guess that idea of using vast data sets to identify potential fu future patterns is something now that is really coming to the forefront in the markets. I guess you're seeing that more at Tickmill as well, Ingmar. Uh, indeed, yes, and uh, and uh, I, I think patterns, more or less, a uh, big big uh, generator of patterns is is really the underlying, let's say, monetary policy or uh, or, or politics uh, in general, and uh, the fact that uh, human beings uh, tend to react uh, to to different uh, circumstances, economic situations, chart patterns, almost uh, the same way across the, across the globe. I've definitely been a fan of, uh, of patterns uh, during my trading uh, career. Also, whilst it's important to make our investment and trading strategies more robust by identifying patterns in the market and using them as a basis for future predictions, that outward view is only one perspective. Here's Andrew Minicker again explaining the importance of looking inwards to identify patterns in our own behavior. Let's hear from Andrew again. There's not just you know, patterns in the, in the chart that we're looking for, but it's patterns within ourselves really is what was, I think, what you were alluding to. And that's really important part of performance improvement for a trader is not simply understanding and paying attention to patterns on the screen, but keeping track of paying attention to and understanding our own personal patterns of thought and, and emotional experience. That's a great point from Andrew. I mean, certainly when I started out, one of the patterns I began to recognize in myself was the idea of revenge trading. So I'd come up with a trading thesis, take put the position on, it would go against me, I'd lose money, and then I'd think, right, I, the market's wrong, I, I'm right. And so I, you know, it, to say it was uh, trading with the strategy is very uh, loosely defined there, but <laughs> that that revenge emotion is is a pattern I recognize within my own behavior. What about you, Ingmar? Did you have any early stories of patterns that you recognize that helped improve your trading? I'm, I've definitely realized, Patrick, at some stage that when you go out with your friends on Friday evenings and then come back and the markets are still open, then you definitely, definitely <laughs> shouldn't trade. And, and uh, when your account has incurred a big loss, then you definitely need to sit tight and not do anything probably for a few days. And in terms of psychology, then uh, what I've seen as well and uh, what I alluded to in the past uh, was that uh, 
I, I've been drawing these kind of uh, charts, uh, confidence charts in my mind when I trade, you know. So if I feel that uh, today is maybe 10% uh, what it was with my best trade, for example, then definitely that confidence that I seem to have today is not enough actually to place, uh, to place the trade. Interesting and certainly valid uh, point about the uh, the Friday night trading setup. <laughs> so we're uh, I guess we're beginning to see a description of trading as a relationship between what's happening out there in the markets and the reaction to that activity in the mind of a trader. Uh, here's Martin again to, to speak on that point. What I basically found was that all markets trade the same because the common denominator is human nature. Basically, we panic the same way, regardless if it's wheat, if it's corn, if it's gold, or it's a currency. So when you're really looking at a chart, you're looking at humans and how they're interacting with that instrument. So I guess that goes back to the point you were making uh, earlier, Ingmar, that the the nature of human beings is uh, is simply to repeat patterns over and over again, regardless of, uh, I guess, the circumstances. It's just the natural human reaction that is, is almost like a default setting. Indeed, yes. And uh, I would say that uh, if uh, all of the market participants uh, would be just uh, small guys like myself, for example, then probably we would be able to predict uh, markets with a high level of accuracy. But uh, what really changes the dynamics in my mind is that there are these whales out there or, or let's say bigger players like uh, so if if you could analyze the behavior of a of a small uh, of a crowd of let's say small investors you would be able to predict but at times you know you would have maybe the bank of japan or uh, or some government uh, coming in with their uh, policy changes or uh, some other news events and that completely changes uh, the dynamics uh, and uh, because small investors generally are not big enough to affect the market and you always need to be aware of these uh, bigger players who come in at uh, you know two o'clock uh, you know in the in the early morning or uh, or on friday evening when you have a have a pint with your friends uh, in the local uh, pub that idea of um trying to analyze and um process the actions of those bigger players and and find patterns like you say i mean the bank of japan certainly are notorious for uh, for taking action uh, the unusual hours of the day. So I guess that uh, that brings us to our third and final big area for discussion, and that's technology as a tool. Thanks to the massive leaps in technology we've seen over the past decades and the acceleration of mobile tech and most certainly AI in recent years, new paths for investors to access markets and new ways to process data have become more widely available. Uh, Harry Tom Christou uh, joined us in episode six to give a rundown of the current ways in which AI is transforming the finance industry. Let's hear from Harry Tom. There are various uh, types of data. For example, there are people looking how many people they have visited a particular store today, how this could actually impact the price of an asset. Uh, we have also seen very, very recently face recognition where uh, the quants trying to find patterns between the face of uh, someone in the banking sector where they announce the interest rate decision is going to affect the market. Yes, I mean, that's uh, certainly one way in which AI has been used. I mean, I've heard of hedge funds using drones uh, to track global shipping patterns and uh, and freight patterns and the, the extent of freight that's occurring globally. So I guess more and more we're going to see that use of artificial intelligence to help to predict future outcomes. Are there any ways that you've seen personally that AI is, is starting to impact trading decisions or investment decisions? Uh, I have, yes. And uh, and I, I really like uh, the the project that uh, Chariton actually runs at Tickmill because, I mean, they look at really vast uh, set of uh, data. You, you wouldn't even imagine that, you know, that, that, that some data sets are available there. And uh, when the tsunami happened uh, in, in Japan, for example, uh, when there was this big tsunami that took out the um, nuclear power plant and everything then, it was later uh, said uh, somewhere in the press that uh, the guys from uh, Goldman's uh, traded, uh, whether it was 10 or 20 seconds before the news uh, hit the wires. 
and uh, and the story was that uh, they were able to place detection mechanisms uh, in the uh, in the buoys uh, circulating uh, around uh, Japan, so they got the signal uh, sooner than the than the rest of the market. And and what what really matters is maybe just uh, you know an edge of maybe one or two seconds, or maybe even uh, smaller edge, and you are able to make uh, millions. So. Uh, so maybe yes, over time, uh, human beings become almost useless when it comes to making trading decisions. Yeah, I guess not only does uh, does tech give us the opportunity to get ever more accurate predictions, like that example there from uh, from Goldman, but I guess it also massively helps to lower the costs associated with trading and allows greater access to multiple markets and multiple financial instruments. CEO of Tickmill UK, Duncan Anderson, joined us for episode eight to talk in depth about how technology has changed our industry. Let's hear from Duncan. What we have now is programmers with the ability, not just able to trade one particular market, but they can trade multiple markets over different time horizons. And this is just as one singular individual. I guess from a provider perspective, in the early 2000s, there were roughly three or four main providers, but the barriers to entry were, were huge. I mean, uh, the cost of building, uh, cost of uh, servicing was enormous. So the cost there was uh, significant. Yeah, I mean, that's a great point from Duncan. I mean, personally, from my experience of, of trading now, uh, similar to you, Ingmar, for nearly 20 years, I've witnessed the, uh, the reduction in costs coming down significantly uh, in terms of access to market. And I guess you as a, as a, a market provider um, have also had to adjust to the market conditions to remain competitive. Indeed. And, uh, and in, in, uh, in our case, so we are somewhat special in that sense that uh, majority of uh, our clients are actually trading with uh, various uh, algorithms. Uh, so uh, the commission rate uh, that we have uh, is extremely sensitive uh, to our uh, client base. And of course, over time, I think there's uh, some sort of uh, stabilization that uh, one could expect because uh, the commissions uh, or the fees really cannot go uh, below zero. And, uh, and at some stage when maybe the weaker market participants are pushed out and uh, com- commission structures maybe or, or the fees in general would, uh, would go uh, higher again. Not only has tech made it uh, easier for experience and, and battle-hardened traders to explore new markets, but the development of platforms that run on the tech in our pockets has opened up the possibility of trading to individuals and retail traders who previously wouldn't have thought to be so hands-on with investing their money. Here's Phoebe again to talk about the benefits of getting started on investment apps. There are apps where you can invest your spare change and you kind of, to a certain extent, get to know how the investment markets work. You get a feel for what it's like to lose money and to gain money through investments. And, you know, that is just testing the waters. That's dipping your little toe in. That's certainly true. I mean, it's uh, it's surprising to me how often when I'm out in public now, you see people on their mobile with either the MT4 or MT5 platform open and, and executing trades. And that has been a, a big proliferation of, of trading uh, into the retail community. And I guess Tickmill have been part of that process. We have, yes. And, uh, and you're spot on in that sense that the developments uh, in the technology space in that sense have been huge. Uh, I remember uh, back in the days when I started trading, then uh, in order to place an options uh, trade, you really need to pick up a phone and call a bank. And uh, I remember the bank would then send out, uh, you know, 20 pages of uh, options uh, agreement and you had to sign it, send it back. And uh, and that was when I was in the university. And, uh, you know, at some stage, uh, because I used the facts in the university, uh, this administration building, at some stage people started looking a little bit uh, suspicious that uh, okay why is this guy coming back uh, all the time and you know getting these faxes and sending them back but uh, today yeah the world is different uh, that everybody has their app and you can really trade any instrument out there like whether it's orange juice or uh, you know cryptos or uh, you know palm oil or uh, whatever so it's it's fascinating but at the same time we have to be mindful also about the risks because many of these uh, you know younger investors, they they are not so concerned about the risk and we have to be mindful a bit about this. 
That's a really good point, Ingmar, because I guess that better access or the proliferation of access to technology that allows more people into the trading world doesn't necessarily mean that all those new traders will do well. Um, Duncan again outlined the importance of uh, research and planning before you make investments or trades. The fact that you can trade like a pro, like a quant, like an institutional player, it, it actually then comes down to you. So first, you, you, you really got to understand exactly what you want to get out of this trading opportunity, this business, yeah? And you've got to treat it like a business, yeah? You can't sort of uh, bullshit yourself, uh, excuse my French, but you, you, know, you have to know what you are getting yourself into and you want to have to know what you're getting yourself into. You've got to create a strategy. You've got to then test it. Yeah, I mean, that's, uh, that's sage advice there from Duncan uh, and especially his French use of it. Um, I guess the, uh, this is it really, um, as certainly from my, my experience, that I only became successful at trading once I started to treat it as a business. So I was taking trades that I'd predefined within, I guess you call it a trading plan, I call it a business plan. Um, and I think those are the real pitfalls for retail traders where they don't treat it as a business. It's more of a, uh, almost a fruit machine that they, um, that's where they, they come unstuck. And certainly I guess you have, have seen that over the years yourself, Ingmar. I have, yes. And, uh, and with, with this new technology, like I was saying before, so the, the concern that I have is that uh, trading uh, has almost uh, become like an entertainment. So uh, people just uh, place trades out of uh, boredom or, uh, or simply that they, you know, they don't have anything else uh, to do. The access to markets uh, and the access to all of these instruments on one side is positive, but uh, on the other side, uh, it's really difficult to make decisions then and pick the right instrument. So back in the days when I started, you know, you, you really had access to maybe like 10, 20 different uh, shares in the local, uh, on the local stock exchange. And then you pretty much knew everything about these companies. But now, so because the, um, the opportunities are, are so huge, uh, you could trade anything. And then most, mostly people don't even understand what they're trading or why they're placing a trade. So, so that's, that's definitely a risk and people should be, uh, you know, thinking about this for sure. Excellent points again, Ingmar. And I guess with these incredible advances in fintech accelerating at an ever-growing pace, it's tempting to imagine a future where humans, with all our biases and emotions, will be obsolete when it comes to managing capital. But from our discussions with industry experts, we've heard how the most likely future is one where AI and other tech works in harmony with human traders with humans guiding the technology and using it as a tool for better outcomes. And that was something that came across from my discussion with Hariton. Let's hear from Hariton again on that point. We see like uh, the next step to be humans along with AI and machine learning to work together, to find patterns and understand. We don't have to forget that, uh, you know, AI is not always like a black box. There are various ways where you can understand a prediction that the model does, and you will be able to go in more deep and understand, okay, why this decision was made, was it correct, was not correct. I've learned over my career that there are certain market environments that I'm particularly good at trading, and there are other environments that I'm not so good at trading, and I've actually, working with development teams, have developed algorithmic models to trade through those periods where, uh, where I'd be less profitable. Is, uh, is that idea of the symbiosis of humans and AI working together, Ingmar, something that you, you, you think is going to be uh, a future development? Absolutely. And um, if I look back um, uh, into like my trading career, then I started using um, so algorithms, I think, already 10 years ago. So, uh, and it was a huge benefit because I remember I was uh, maybe, you know, sitting uh, on a beach somewhere and... Uh, and at the same time, uh, my algorithm uh, was trading uh, the, the pound dollar. Uh, so it was um, a Forex related uh, EA that I had at the time. But uh, it would be interesting uh, to see what would happen, you know, if the central bank decisions, as an example, or policy decisions themselves would also be made by AI driven uh, machines. Uh, because uh, if that is not the case, then there's always a level of uncertainty that one has. So the, you, you might have the best computer, you might have the, be, uh, the best uh, AI software, but 
as long as there are people uh, at the BOJ or uh, or uh, or the Fed that make decisions, then uh, there are always going to be surprises, uh, surprises that even the best AI is uh, unable to foresee. Yeah, and I guess for uh, for the final word on the the topic with respect to to AI and and humans working together, here's Paul again from episode five with his vision for the future of humans and technology working together. When I talk to people who play chess at a very, very serious senior level, they tell me the following things. The machine will beat a human being. The best machine will beat the best human beings. However, the combination of a human being and a machine will beat the best machine. So if that's true, and if that carries over that simple argument, and it may be too simple, but I I retain my faith in the ability of, of human beings to make good decisions for the benefit of in, in this case, investment or chess or whatever it may be. Ingmar, thanks so much for joining us today. And to our audience, thanks for joining us on this season of Bright Minds from Ticknell. We hope you've enjoyed these conversations as much as we have. And we hope that you've come away with lots of useful guidance and ideas on how to improve your own trading life. Ingmar, thanks again for joining us today. Thank you, Patrick. It was a pleasure attending the show. Mm-hmm.